Please note this meeting is recorded and streamed live. These recordings are published on the relevant meeting page of the Council's website. By choosing to attend this public meeting, you're deemed to have given your consent to being filmed or recorded and for any footage to be broadcast or published. If the alarm sounds, the premises must be evacuated immediately. Do not spend time collecting personal belongings. <clears throat> All emergency escape routes are clearly signed. Once you have left the building, the assembly point is in the high street opposite the guild hall. Members and other speakers are reminded to use their microphone when speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Neela, for that's very kind. Just, um, Julian, any substitutes? Chair, yeah, do have a couple of substitutes with you tonight. Um, Simon Garrity is here for Councillor Andy Stafford. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Bayliss is here for Councillor Chris Mitchell. Um, and now we have got a couple of public speakers as well, just in a, a little while on the agenda. Um, just, uh, I think you wanted to introduce the committee as well to a couple of visitors we've got tonight. That's, I, I will uh, do. Sergeant Simon Hallam and PC Jen Evans, um, who are just sat over the opposite side of the room. <laughs> Thank you, um, uh, Julian. I think Lord, I, I kindly ask Lloyd to introduce, but you've done uh, accurately the introduction very well. I, just for members only, can I just, uh, I know there's quite a large audience in, uh, among us, but can we just go around the committee just to introduce ourselves, just name. Uh, I'm Councillor Ditter, I'm Chair of Licensing Cathedral Ward. Um, to my right. Uh, Lloyd Griffiths, Corporate Director, Operations, Homes and Communities. Uh, Richard Udall, Councillor for St John's. Simon Cronin, Councillor for Nunnery. Jenny Barnes, Councillor for Arboretum. Uh, Karen Lawrence, Councillor for Claims. Mohammed Sajad, Worcester Taxi Drivers Association Chairperson. Harris Salim, Spokesperson for the Trade Taxis. Simon. Simon Garrity, Councillor St Clement. Uh, Councillor James Stanley, Gorse Hill. Councillor Mark Bayliss, Edward Dean. Vanessa Brown, Solicitor. Thank you. Kieran Lahau, Licensing Manager. Of course, everybody knows. Uh, yeah, Norma Benjamin, <laughs> Principal Licensing Officer. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you. Naya. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nida, sorry. I thought I introduced Nida in the beginning, sorry. Councillor Sand, Wandon Villages, Forgive and me. Vice for Licensing Committee. Thank you. Thank you for that, that's very kind. Um, any declaration of interest, please? Being none, thank you. Um, pub public, I say, I think we have. Did, um, oh, Julian's gone. Yes, please. Chair. Um, we've got Mr. Sajad and Mr. Salim who'd like to address the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Gentlemen, as you are familiar with this territory, I'm sure um, that you have five minutes between you. How you combine that between you, that's your privilege. But please allow the, the other one to finish. But if there is, you know, a, a, a direction, but try and keep it within the five minutes. I think there's somebody be monitoring you from my right and left, so be aware of that. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yeah, good evening, uh, ma'am. Go on, Simon. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you for that correction. I, I was told five minutes, but I think it's five minutes each. That's what the... Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody, members. Um, in December, I put a proposal in on behalf of the trade for a fare increase, and um, I was having dialogue with Niall over the fare increase, um, and then in January and February, we met with um, Niall and we sat down with yourself as well, Chairperson, and I think we had the, the lady there as well from the police. And um, Niall should have submitted a report on the agenda for a fare increase. I mean, be if it was 30, 40% I was asking for, or 10%, but Niall should have submitted on this agenda for, on behalf of the trade, for the trade, but I think I believe that, you know, it's not acceptable. Um, the trade is suffering and uh, um, basically I'm not happy with the practice that's gone on. And uh, it's unfair on the trade what's going on. But um, these politics shouldn't be played against the trade. It's wrong. But Niall, I'm sure, should have done his job right 
and should have put a fair increase, be it if your members don't agree with it, but at least you've got something to agree on or disagree with. And I've got all the emails that I had, Niall. He should have submitted a report, two reports or three reports, but I think it's for you guys to discuss because uh, I'm going to uh, leave it at that and I'll let um, Masa Harris speak to you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, to allow me a few minutes on behalf of the Taxi Association. First of all, uh, my apology to the, uh, to the House that I missed uh, my proposal to the taxi fare increase to Niall. Uh, for my own personal uh, reasons, uh, I got a different role as well. I think most of them know me, my other role as well. And, but now, uh, obviously the first, uh, the proposal Mr. Sajjad gave, uh, I think that was uh, not acceptable by, I don't know what reasons, but I think as a trade, we need an urgent meeting to review this, this, this ta taxi fare again. Till June is far too late, as I believe, because for the last five years, we never had a, a fare increase. And till June, I think it's, the trade will be die, or they will be looking some other jobs. Uh, I can assure you this. So that's the one point. And the second one is, for the trade, I think we need frequently meetings between the trade uh, representatives, taxi bases, and with the uh, council as well. That's very important because it's not just taxi fare. Uh, there are some other matters to be discussed as well, uh, which we face as a taxi drivers on a regular basis, and this needs to be addressed. That's another thing. And, uh, and another, um, I must appreciate and thank the council for granting us the taxi rank on Cathedral Square. Thank you for that. Yeah, and uh, another thing is, I have been suggested or, uh, by the taxi bases, they need to be, I think they've already been uh, contacted by, by the Niall, but in future, if cathedral cars, A1 taxis and TOA taxis are invited as well in the meetings uh, to represent their trade as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, um, I'm, I'm sure that the officers and um, that we, um, we will take that on board and there will be some relevant um, to you. I think one of the items that you've already related to is on the agenda, so we'll be discussing that. Um, the next item is minutes. Can I have your indulgence? Thank you, Richard. Can I... Ah, Simon. Uh, yeah, I just want to question the bottom of the front page, which refers to public representations. It does say that officers advised Mr. Sajad that the Worcester Taxi Forum previously raised the issue of fare increases and been asked to forward a proposal to the licensing office for the committee to consider. It sounds like that has been done and it's not come to the committee. So it, I, I'm not sure that I'm really questioning the accuracy of the minutes, but it's not an accurate description of what's now happening. So I wonder if you can just explain why we haven't got this on the agenda for tonight. Um, I think Niall um, could um, give you a chapter in this, but uh, as the um, speaker alluded to, that um, I was at the forum meeting, and some of the things that they were suggested wasn't quite right. We asked for additional information from them, and that wasn't come forth with. So 
No, I'll let you um, answer that. Uh, Mark. Mark. Chairman, um, far be it for me to tell you how to run your licensing committee, but we're on item uh, uh, four, is it? On, uh, on the minutes, and it, you are to, uh, for them to be approved and signed. We don't have a matters arising, Chairman. I think I think you should you should move to this being the minutes being approved, and then and then if Councillor Cronin wishes to pursue it, maybe you'll allow him some other point. But I think the minutes should be approved at this point. Um, well, the mover of the approval of the minutes, I think what I'm hearing from my right is whether the minutes have actually been actioned and whether the report has come forward or not. Um, there has been an accusation made by a member of the public uh, that uh, a report should have been here at this committee here today. Can we have some clarification whether that is correct or incorrect so we can determine whether these minutes are accurate? Thank you, Richard. I'll let uh, Lloyd come in and give you sort of hold on, Niall, so for a minute. Th thank you, Chair. Um, I, I can confirm that information has come forward, um, but it's our job as officers to put in front of members sufficient information for a decision to be made. Um, at the point of reaching this committee, we weren't able to do that. So in all fairness to the drivers, information has been submitted, but we can't simply just put that into your laps without giving it some sort of context, um, some sort of research and, and, and briefing into that to, 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 so, so that you're well informed. Um, to make the correct decision. So, so our aim, absolutely, is to bring something back to the next committee that's a well-informed paper that allows you to make the right decision. I am right in understanding that the next committee is not until June. That, that, uh, in that case, Chair, I would ask you to give some urgent consideration that as soon as the report is ready to be submitted, we have a special meeting of the Licensing Committee in order to determine that, because it would be unfair, regardless of how I personally view uh, any application, for, to ask the trade to wait until June. So as soon as it's ready, if you could have an urgent meeting to give some consideration to that, that would be useful. Thank, thank you, Richard. I think because the, the speakers highlighted that request, uh, we were going to talk about that. But I'm more than happy, I think we have a sort of agreement on that but we would move you swiftly. Can I go back to uh, committee and get back to the minutes, please? Can I, and I think it's moved. <laughs> it was moved, um, seconded, and agreed. Um, Signed, and yeah, thank you for that. That's very kind. We go back to the main agenda, though. Item five, I think. Um, proposal for the um, cathedral. That's what already mentioned. No, are you? Sorry? Jump to the police item first. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. go on. Chair, um, we're, doing the, we're doing a slightly backward, for, but yeah. Chair, Chair, at a previous committee, I think it was agreed um, that it would be beneficial to, to members to, to receive a sort of a short update um, from police colleagues. Um, and as Dem Services uh, said earlier, we've got Sergeant Simon Hallam along yeah. uh, and PC Jen Evans. <clears throat> I think members wanted to yeah. um, put a face to a name um, and, and just get, get a bit of a feel for the work that uh, police licensing colleagues are, are undertaking. So I think we said that sort of five five, ten minutes just to brief us on, on what's going on in police licensing world uh, will be beneficial to all of us. Please, please um, have a seat. I think you, uh, because it's recorded, we, I'm afraid we have to use microphones. That's the only, you know, sorry uh, to jump the gun, but yeah, very welcome. I'm very grateful for your indulgence. We did meet at the forum anyway, but over to you. We did. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members and uh, the taxi forum attendees that are here tonight. Um, this was just an opportunity, um, thank you for inviting us to attend, for us just to introduce ourselves um, from a licensing perspective from, from the police side of things within South Worcestershire. Um, I am Sergeant Simon Hallam. This is my co uh, colleague here, PC Jen Evans, and between us, we are responsible for the licensing matters for all of South Worcestershire for West Mercia uh, Police. Um, I just want to make the point without going into too much detail about all of the work that we do that involves um, the, the joint visits, the term, temporary notice applications that come through our office, the license amendments, the taxi um, issues that we have to get involved in, and all matters licensing. Um, suffice to say that Jen's on her own, um, and, and we're backed up as best as possible by a couple of other colleagues in the office. Uh, we spread very, very thin, and I need to say thank you to, to Niall and the WRS team, because we do lots of joint working with uh, Worcester Reg Services to achieve our aims, uh, which is to try and keep Worcester City and South Worcestershire a safe place for all of our nighttime economy users and anybody in the licensing business. Um, the, the majority of our work does consist of building those relationships with licensees um, and attendees to those premises. Um, we quite stringently work with 
um, DPS colleagues at premises to ensure that licensing objectives are met. Um, dare I say it, we've been quite successful with regards to that. Our command team in South Worcestershire very much foster a working with promise, premises to resolve issues before we come to a licensing review committee hearing. Um, and in my time in, in this role, um, just over 12 months or so, I think we've only had to come to committee hearing once or twice for some um, temporary event notice um, application objections that we have raised. Um, the issues that have arisen have been resolved by way of Jen and um, assistance from WRS colleagues to have those um, constructive conversations with DPS and managers of premises uh, by way of instigation of action plans to, to achieve objectives and they've been successful. Um, so that, that, that is a bit of a nutshell with regards to the work that we do. Um, I feel it just relevant, if it's okay with you, just to give you an update with regards to the, the situation with regards to COVID, which was a big, big demand on, on all of us um, throughout the past 18 months, um, not just within the licensing sector, but all sectors for policing. Um, during that time, Jen has been working very, very closely with uh, Worcester Egg Services colleagues to ensure that all of those COVID regulations and requirements of premises has been adhered to. We've done as best as we can with regards to that, acknowledging that some gaps do appear and some, some fish fall through the net, if I'm able to describe it as such. But in the main, we've come through that period um, as successfully as resources and capacity has allowed us to do so. Um, moving on from that, we are now seeing the nighttime economy, certainly in Worcester, and the issues that are arising from an antisocial behaviour and disorders perspective increasing again now. And we're seeing a little bit of a return back to the situation pre-COVID in terms of levels. Uh, that is being addressed by uh, the officers who police the nighttime economy, particularly within Worcester City itself, uh, where there's lots of communication between Jen and the information that she gains from premises um, and from uh, Worcester Egg Services Intelligence that we put out to those officers so they can focus on those premises and those hotspot locations that are, co um, that are causing us those main problems. <laughs> We, we continue to watch this space with regards to how this year develops because, of course, we are now seeing an upturn in um, 10 applications, temporary event notice, um, notice applications for this year, and we're expecting that to go through the roof, so to speak, with, with those applications coming through. We will, of course, look at each one of those applications objectively, and we will object to those when it's justified to do so. Um, but we are also conscious of the fact that we've had 18 months to two years without quite a lot of these events going on in our local communities and we'll be supporting any applicants as best as we're able to to ensure that those events can go ahead go ahead safely. Uh, the last little point I just want to raise in relation to this and to provide some reassurance was on the back of the the national topic that was raised late last year with regards to um, drink spiking and drug spiking within the nighttime establishment uh, not just in Worcester City but across the board um, nationally. I just want to reassure the committee that actually a a strict process has now been implemented within the police in terms of any reports that we get of such nature. And that involves a full assessment and review of the information that's provided by an alleged victim and a strict process that attending officers has to follow um, in that first golden hour, as we call it, for, for evidence and seizure of um, appropriate information. Each one of those incidents is assessed by CID colleagues and where appropriate relevant um, forensic analyses have been completed. I've got figures here for you all that hopefully go, go towards reassuring that across the board in West Mercia, we aren't seeing a major issue with regards to that. Uh, for instance, figures for South Worcestershire since September show us having 56 reported incidents that are of a, an alleged drug spiking, drink spiking issue. We haven't had in South Worcestershire, it's certainly not been brought across our desks, to, sub to suggest rather that any of those have been substantiated that have resulted in any serious sexual offence or other offence um, commission. So we're taking reassurance by that point and we continue to watch uh, this space with regards to it. Uh, the last point I'd raise in relation to that topic was that we saw spikes, I shouldn't use the word spike, I apologise, we, we saw raises around November, December and January, which we would see anyway during any nighttime economy for any issues relating to licensing. Uh, the latest figures, though, in February have shown virtually a 50% decrease um, since those key months of November, December and January. So hopefully we're coming out of that um, period where members of the public are understanding um, 
of what the reporting process is. We've tried to highlight that in terms of reassurance as opposed to scaremongering. And Jen and other officers from the Safer Neighbourhood teams have been out reassuring and liaising with premises to ensure that they are fully up to um, speed in terms of what is required of them to ensure that any vulnerable persons in their premises are looked after properly. Um, and that, that's it succinctly from me, if, if that makes sense for you all there. Thank you. Um, the only other thing that we need to add is I know it was brought up last time is the purple flag and the best bar none um, scheme. The training's now been completed, so we are assessor trained. So I'm assessor trained along with members of the bid. Um, so we will be getting out now and the <coughs> assessments will start and the purple flag um, has begun as well in terms of there will be an assessment um, in March just to get that underway to see what we need to do to be able to complete our assessment in June and hopefully be accredited. So there's a lot of work started with that and it'll snowball from now on, I think, until June. So it's a good thing moving forward. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. It's thank very you, useful. And, and I think I speak on behalf of the committee. Thank you for all you do. It's uh, sometimes not um, appreciated in the circumstances, but I think uh, under the circumstances we've felt through everybody, you, you pulled your weight. So thank you for coming and, and you're more than happy to <clears throat> indulge on our uh, wisdom. But if you wish to go, you, 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 you equally. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Item five, proposal of the appointment of the evening rank. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman, members. Uh, yes, if you'd like to turn to, uh, it is page five, agenda item number five, and this is a proposal to appoint an evening Hackney Carriage Stand at Cathedral Square. But a background to this report, members, is that in 2014, as I'm sure you're all aware, Cathedral Square underwent a major development um, as part of the city centre enhancement scheme. Now, at that time, there was a requirement to remove an already situated Hackney Carriage rank and push it further along the road, uh, but in doing so, uh, removed one of the spaces. Now, since that time, we're all aware that this particular area has become a very popular location uh, and, a, and an important part of the nighttime economy. Lots of bars, restaurants, uh, and it is utilised by members of the public of an evening. Uh, and as we're coming out of the pandemic, again, we can see it's, it's a popular location. It's one of the uh, locations in the city centre that attracts a lot of people. So. So on an informal basis, uh, Hackney Carriage drivers and lots of members here in the gallery are using the bus lay-by, uh, which is in place on an informal basis. Now, initially wasn't a particular problem, uh, but it was raised at a Hackney Carriage and Tackney C forum uh, that, that we would like to put this on a more formal footing. Uh, simply parking in a bus stop isn't really acceptable. Um, and it is actually in contravention of some of the rules and regulations. So what we did, uh, we said that we would look into the matter to see what the process was, but maybe using the bus lay-by that is there at the moment as a dual purpose. Bus lay-by whilst during the day, whilst being used by bus companies, um, and of an evening, converting it into a hack and carriage rank so that it can be used by the city centre taxi drivers. Uh, this is something which we liaised with the county council on um, and we had support we're pleased to say we had support from the county council uh, the report mentions about the uh, traffic regulation order without going into too many details and the uh, technicalities of it it means that the bus lay-by can be used as a dual purpose hackney carriage and bus lay-by so so that's what we're here today that is the proposal being put forward uh, we've also consulted with the Council's Transport Network Development Commissioning Manager, it's a good title, um, who has liaised with the bus company. So he's had initial liaison, really to make sure that the proposal's suitable for all parties. And, and in principle, they've come back and they're, they're happy with the proposal, which is why it's been put before members this evening. So we don't anticipate um, any issues coming back from the bus companies. So the preferred option being put forward, considering uh, all aspects, is to put forward and carry out the process and the legal process at the council to put in place a taxi rank order uh, to use the bus lay-by in Cathedral Square as a taxi rank between certain times. Now, the times uh, that were being put forward 
are between the hours of 8.30 in the evening, so that's 8.30 p.m., uh, and 6, 6 a.m. in the morning. So obviously the buses aren't running at that time. There'll be no clash between public transport providers um, or uh, Hackney carriage drivers. So we're hoping that that will suit and accommodate everybody, making sure that there is public transport in that popular location uh, to get members of the public home. The legal requirements are in the report. I'm not going to go through them, but there is a requirement for the council to carry out a consultation. This is done by way of a public notice in the press, uh, but we will bring it to the attention of the bus companies uh, and other people that it is being pub publicised uh, in order for them to put forward their comments should they, should they wish to. Obviously, it's open for members of the public to raise um, anything with the council as well, and they will need to be considered. Um, the option to take no action and simply leave in place the informal working agreement has been dismissed by officers. It's, it's not really acceptable anymore. Um, it's been going on for a number of years. So, so the preferred option is to put forward and go forward with the consultation. Uh, that is the matter before you tonight, members. I'm sure you'll have uh, questions, and I'll happily try and answer them if I can. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tyler. Very helpful. Before I bring Simon Mark and Kate, um, uh, I just wanted to, to put there the speaker so what Mr. News has said that they have regarded it's subject to the yes. consultation yes, that's period. Right. Um, sorry, it's subject to the consultation period and, uh, and the order going in, and I think it's 28 days. And I think uh, it, it's down to Chair and the Vice Chair, and of course, uh, the Director of Corporate Services to uh, move the process forward. Uh, I'll bring in Mike. Mark? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think this is a this is a very sensible um, proposal, and one that I think will find favour with the people of Worcester and with the trade. And so I'm I'm very happy to to support this. Um, I hope that we can bring this forward, and this can be dealt with as quickly as possible. Um, can I, however? segue from that to ask um, obviously people using this stand will also be wondering what fares they'll be able to charge so you, you gave an undertaking earlier that this would come back can I ask can I pressure a little bit more and, and the officers a little bit more to give an undertaking of when the fair proposal will come back to this committee so so that I'm, I'm hoping that it will be relatively quickly so that people using this stand uh, we'll get them uh, the fare that they, they need to operate, because I was very worried about what um, yeah, one no, of the public no, no, no. speakers said, that this wouldn't, um, um, uh, the, the trade wouldn't survive long without them. Um, thanks, Mark, leader. I, I, as usual, you always put me on the spot, but uh, the argument isn't with us, it's, it's with the trade. If the trade bring uh, a, a reasonable request, and then the officers deal with that uh, request as, as normal. Um, and I think, the, I don't know, the chairman or the vice chairman, I don't know, <laughs> Um, the ins and outs of that are admitted that they missed that sort of corridor um, because it has to be advertised and put on the agenda prior to uh, um, oh, the, the time of the mosque. Right. Um, so it, it is that scenario. But I'll bring in Lloyd to, to, to make more because he was there as well. So, Chair, we, we just checked Puda date. So I think Puda date is, is 28th of March. Um, so I think you know, if, we, if we have sufficient information to be able to turn a report around, we'll be looking before the 28th of March. I'm sure the trade is listening, so um, the, it, the onus is really and truly, uh, they say the board is in their court, it's, it, they have to provide that, we have to assess it, because we are arteries between the public and them, we, we, we're not the servants of just one sort of it. Uh, Simon, do you want to come in? Thank you, yeah. Chair. It's just to speak on, on the proposal, because I understand issues being raised about other matters, and a substitute on the committee won't uh, entertain that debate, because it's for officers and members of the committee to obviously have a report at a future meeting. And I think we'd all want to see that at an appropriate time with the, with the full evidence, but as soon as possible. I think that's a, well, everyone's heard the, uh, the pleas made by, uh, by, by the trade. But just addressing this matter, uh, Mr Chairman, I'm very glad to see this proposition come forward, because I think as has been set out, this has been an informal arrangement for quite a long time. And it's important, I think, to regularise that and obviously to strike that right balance to appreciate that the taxi trade provides a really important public transport mechanism out of the hours of when buses are operating in Worcester, which we know is, is limited somewhat. And whilst uh, we hope to expand that um, in the years to come, I think we all accept that, you know, uh, there will be 
a need and a strong need to make sure that people can use taxis. And it's a really popular spot, Mr Chairman, um, in terms of Cathedral Square. And we can see that trade coming back now after the pandemic. We're all great to see that trade coming back. And I've certainly uh, had representations from members of the public or businesses in that area um, who, have, who have asked over uh, recent years whether we can formalise such an arrangement. And I think this is a good balance. You know, 8.30 in the evening is early enough to catch that evening trade when people have gone out for a meal, to come out of those restaurants uh, or bars, want to get into a cab, uh, want to do it properly in an official uh, location. Um, and we can publicise that and regularise that seems a very sensible thing. Um, so we're maximising the, the, the highway space. We're doing it um, in terms of a really popular location. And I think it's something that I'd hope through the consultation, we'll listen to, obviously the committee will listen to what, uh, uh, what's raised, but I hope that uh, people do write in support and make those representations because I'm sure it will be a popular measure to formalise that. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think this is obviously an important step forward and something which we've been, many of us have been calling for for some time. I know we've had problems implementing anything because of the issues of COVID and related to it, but it's long overdue and it's something which I think would have universal support amongst members. Uh, I do query with the, when the leader of the County Council is present, uh, whether he could actually uh, entertain the policy of allowing taxes to use bus lanes as well, uh, something which uh, we have been asking for for some time and has been passed as a resolution in Council and still hasn't happened. So I'll, I'll be interested to know why that's the case, but I'll also be interested to know where we can actually potentially have more taxi ranks in the city, uh, not just the city centre but some of these suburban areas as well. For instance, St John's, is. there's a lot of requests I have from residents for a taxi rank in St John's. So maybe it's something we need to explore of not only having this site as a taxi rank, but looking for other opportunities as well. Uh, and reaffirming our commitment to ensuring that the uh, trade can actually continue or start to use bus lanes. Uh. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally in, a, in agreement with this proposal. Um, I'm just puzzled as to why it's taken so long for us to actually approve this. I know I've been talking about it for several years. It's been blindingly obvious that the bus stop is only used when buses are running and at night when taxis need to use it, they've been officially prevented and they've only been able to use it because there's been a tolerance to them breaking official rules. It, it was a ridiculous situation. It should have been put right a very long time ago. And I'm glad that at last we've got this uh, motion. I totally agree with it. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> as somebody who regularly gets a taxi from this rank, unofficial rank, um, I... I very much welcome this. There's nothing else at this end of the high street. So, especially if it's a wet or cold day, walking from one end of the high street to another to get a taxi, if you don't choose to phone for one, is a real issue. I would bring your attention to the times that are suggested. 8.30, well, the last bus has long gone by 7 o'clock. So, I think think that we could actually bring the time forward to say seven o'clock Monday to Friday the last bus is 1856 Saturday it's 1845 and there's only two buses all day on a Sunday so maybe we need to have a think about that as well but certainly bring it forward to seven o'clock thank you Chairman, thank you. I would like to echo everything I've heard so far. I think um, the comments are very sensible. The proposal is very sensible. Uh, whatever we can do to aid the trade um, going forward, it's been a very difficult time for everyone, but certainly, certainly everyone connected to to of the hospitality trade, and that includes people who uh, are working to get folks home. Should, we should do everything we can to support them. Uh, and I would actually, I, uh, Jenny Barnes's proposal, I think, is, uh, has some merits. I think we should look at, at the, the timings again to widen them, you know, where appropriate. But I, I certainly think that should be uh, uh, something we take on board.
Um, thanks, um, Jenny. And um, before I bring Pat in, um, th there's some issue about the time for seven o'clock. There is a, a other work that's been doing. So we we we've done a balance um, with the with the bus and everybody. So let's let's move it on and let's get the consultation forward and see what that um, brings. Pat, um, so, sorry, Jack. Can you clarify what you mean? But there's a balance. What's the objection to seven o'clock and what's the background to it? Maybe the officer can explain. Well, We've been through that. Um, I was requesting seven till seven, and it wasn't uh, feasible for the other developments. So let's, you know, it's it's a compromise, and I'm happy to take that. I'm forward. sorry. I, I just need. To, I, I hear what you're saying. It wasn't possible, and had to make a compromise. Who did we have to make a compromise with? Why did we have to make a compromise? And I think it's a very sensible suggestion, which is made made by Council Barnes, supported across the table. Um, I need to know why we can't move that forward and add that, uh, add that as an amendment to the motion which is before us. Is there any good reason why we can't do that? I've been far superior person to explain it to you, far later than myself. Lloyd. <laughs> I, I don't think that's the case, Chair, but um, I, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, I, I think it's part of the Please. consultation process um, and part of getting to this uh, point. Um, two of the key stakeholders are both the, the County Council um, and obviously um, a stagecoach. Um, now, if we don't get support from both those organisations in respect of this proposal, um, then I think it stands a, a fair chance of failure. And having consulted with both those organisations, um, they are comfortable um, with this proposal. And I can only imagine there needs to be some time built into a timetable for overruns uh, and those types of things. So, so at the moment, two key stakeholders are supporting this proposal, um, and this gives it the best chance of, of, of going through. Let, let's move it forward. Is the I just add to that, Mr. Chairman, which will just maybe help some, provide some clarity, which is the County Council has a uh, bus service improvement plan that wishes to see enhanced public transport offer in many parts of the county. It's got a bid into government a significant sum of money. Um, and as part of that, we want to make sure that we can operate buses slightly longer than the current bus time. So Jenny's absolutely right in terms of pointing out bus services stop very, very quickly in the service in the in the evening. And if it's possible to extend that, that is what the bus service improvement plan has. So I think that was officers' concern that in formalising the, the changes, they wanted to just give a little leeway to make sure that you weren't implementing a proposal that would prevent buses uh, stopping a little later. So if that that can be ex extended. So sometimes the perfect is the, is the enemy of the good, as I describe, and I think this is a sensible balance to allow people in the evening economy to use it as well as overnight trade. But I hope that clarification just helps members. Yeah, that's very helpful. Pat, long waited, sorry. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this item, Chair. Um, I'm a regular taxi user too, in fact, pretty much daily. So one of the things I'm really aware of is how many taxis are around at any given time. I think it's a great idea that we're offering new opportunities and new ranks to the trade. I think it will, you know, it will help greatly at a time of what I would think of as crisis in the trade. Um, you know, petrol prices going up, all the rest of it, at a huge rate. I think we really do need to do all that we can to support them. Um, and I, I would just add that the demand is really quite difficult to assess at the moment. I agree we should have new ranks. I absolutely think so. But at the moment, I'm finding it very difficult to get a taxi at lot for long periods during the day at the moment. So, you know, there can be, what, half an hour, maybe three quarters of an hour at different points in the day, particularly at the, during the week, where it's really difficult to get a taxi. So anything that makes it easier has got to be good, quite frankly. There are, of course, a lot of eateries, a lot of restaurants at the cathedral end of town. So I think drivers may expect to get quite a lot of trade from there. But I do hope also that you will consider very urgently the issues that trade members have expressed to you today. Yes. Uh, and perhaps earlier than four months, I, you know, if, if you don't mind my asking, because I do think that, you know, the crisis we have in petrol prices and inflation and all the rest of it is affecting everybody and the taxi trade in particular that depends so so crucially and so directly on petrol prices thank you very much <clears throat> the committee's explored all the we only i think it's all the paper hang on if i get my papers right can we uh, what is it oh, it's right so 
one and and one point one and one point two. Can we um, <coughs> have it? Yeah. So you lost my way then. There you go. Yep. Yeah, um, can we note the um, contents of the meeting? I think if we go through the the three one point one one point two or one point three on the order paper as it is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, um, Um, can we go on to agenda item? Any more? Can we give them a Can we go um, on to sorry you can go. Yeah. item um, general item six please um, over to you now you thank you, you again, the floor today members <laughs> yes well done. Uh, so again oh, jumped up it's page eleven of your report packet it's under agenda item number six and this is the draft hackney carriage and private hire licensing policy and it's a review of the consultation responses. Uh, some background to this report, members. Um, you'll be aware of a meeting last year, June 21st. Members considered a draft Hackney Carriage policy, private hire policy in response to the Secretary of State's uh, publishing the statutory guidance. Uh, it was presented to members, uh, the statutory guidance, and it was all about safeguarding and how to protect the vulnerable. Um, since that time, officers have been out to consultation on that draft document um, and undertaken a 12-week consultation um, with relevant stakeholders, members of the trade. It, it's, it's all highlighted in the report who we've consulted with in detail. Um, the policy itself uh, was a major uh, rewriting of the council's policies in relation to their hacker carriage and private hire functions uh, and took some time. So that's why we um, endeavoured to undertake the full 12 week consultation. It's going to uniform the policies across the council uh, so it will mirror our neighbours uh, who are also going through this process. They have also taken the time to review their hackney carriage and private policies. It's something which has been called for in this forum a number of times. You know, can we get to a stage where our policies are similar but still beneficial? to Worcester City Council. Um, and that's hopefully where we're at at the moment. Um, we were pleased to say when we drafted our policies, we were already meeting much of the requirements of the statutory guidance from the Department of Transport. Uh, we were already there. We already had them in our policies. We'd adopted our policies on safeguarding, unlike um, some other local authorities in the UK uh, who were Quite, quite some distance behind. So, so what we've done is actually pick up on the other ones uh, which are highlighted in the report again um, and included them in the draft policy. Now the consultation as I say took place over 12 weeks. Um, the consultation was undertaken by way of a questions and answers survey on our website. We also had printed copies for those people that uh, wanted a printed copy. Um, and we've attached all of the replies, including the comments which we received during the consultation period, at Appendix 1. Uh, hopefully you've had a time to read through them and look at some of the questions. Some concerns were raised, uh, and I have tried to address those concerns for members, certainly for some of the um, questions which were raised in concern, uh, which is at a page at Appendix 3. Yeah. So, so hopefully, again, you've had a look at those, and certainly the officers' comments. Um, in mitigation to some of those concerns, I think cost is, is clearly one of the concerns which was raised by the existing license holders and how it will affect them when coming to renew licenses. Um, it, it will have a fairly minimal impact 
uh, to our existing license holders. Um, and again, at 3.8, it, it, it goes how we've gone some way to mitigate those concerns which were raised. And that's one of the important ones we've introduced, or we're proposing to introduce, a partial refund scheme for licenses. Up until now, most license holders, if for whatever reason, unforeseen circumstances, have to surrender a license, whether that be a driver's license or a vehicle license, maybe due to accident damage, um, we haven't been in the position to refund licenses because there isn't a policy on it. But now we've, we've looked at it and we'll be issuing uh, partial refunds on any issues which are brought forward to the council. Um, one of the things which has been causing a major problem recently is the engine capacity or CC size. We'll probably see over time, uh, as vehicles become more fuel efficient, uh, the engine size have reduced. I think we're all of a certain age where we remember engine capacities, uh, the bigger the engine, the more powerful. But those days are behind us. Uh, we're in a position where there are a lot of very economical vehicles uh, of a smaller engine size, and it all comes down to power output. So the removal of that should be beneficial to the trade and certainly limit the number of reports that are being presented towards members at the moment when considering engine capacity. Um, the DBS checks is one that certainly drivers are concerned about. At the moment, we undertake a DBS check every three years. One of the proposals being put forward by the Secretary of State is that this should be done every six months. And we put forward a proposal to make this as uh, painless as possible, uh, where the drivers will sign up to an update service every year. That, that facility is already available, but most drivers uh, tend to leave the update service and just go for the three yearly licences. Uh, again, hopefully I've addressed that in the report on how that will be beneficial to the council with our six monthly checks uh, and stopping then having to pass that charge on to drivers every six months to undertake a new DBS check. Uh, by signing up to the update service, they simply provide us with a code uh, and we can go online and check uh, that everything is as it should be when it comes to criminal histories. Um, and again, the introduction of a more efficient process for relicensing suspended vehicles. This is something which has always been a bit of a contention for officers. It's, it's in the legislation, it's archaic, uh, so we've addressed it in our policies so that that can be uh, brought back or vehicle licenses can be brought back to life where necessary. So, so we're asking, certainly officers uh, are asking members today, the preferred option is having regard to the comments which were received during the consultation period, and again are contained in your report, uh, to approve the draft policy at Appendix 2 for approval by this Council. Um, alternative options, you can make no changes to your policy, it's within the gift of the Council, but this isn't recommended. There is an expectation from the Department of Transport and the Secretary of State that this Council will consider the proposals being put forward in the statutory standards and a amend their policies accordingly, which, which we've done and that's a proposal being put forward. Uh, the legal implications are contained within your report. Uh, we've undertaken the necessary consultation on the draft policy, so it's left the members today to consider those responses, consider the policy uh, and go forward with the recommendations. I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, should they arise. Um, so I'll leave it with you now, Chair. To, uh, Thank you, Niall. That's very comprehensive and uh, it's very well presented. Before I open it to the floor, I've got a couple of questions. One um, was that I think we raised it at the forum. If um, the applicants have a, a current one, which is county or somewhere, that would be applied for all they need to do is show us uh, the DPS. Uh, I, I assume some sort of documentation. Yes, and that, that's, that, that's the, the benefits of the update service. So any applicant coming to the council now simply produces a DBS certificate, and if they're on the update service, uh, they provide us with a code, we go in and check, and there's no need for them to undertake a very expensive DBS check uh, at their expense. So, so that, that, that is being proposed, and, and it's in place at the moment, but, but of course when they go for their county council badges, which lots of operators do and drivers do, again it would be beneficial. There's no need to undergo two checks. Uh, with both organisations. Except one. Thank you for that. The other one, before I bring you Richard, uh, I've got one more, which is 4.33, is it? One, sorry, 4.13. And it goes on to the same sort of thing, 4.23. Um, could you just, can you pick that up on page 93? 
Um, just, just want to clarify a little bit of um, within the actual policy itself. Yeah, it, it's in the policy. Um, just want to clear my head around that. It's. Sorry, so we're looking at page 93. 93, 4.13. Any person who lives outside the UK... For a period of three months or more, yeah, uh, continuous right. of the region, must provide a criminal record and hand certificate of good character from each country outside the UK that yeah. they've lived in. Yeah, that, that's, the one I, that's the one I would slightly want to explore, because sometimes um, some people don't keep an accurate record in this current situation, you might not get one or anything. And I know the number of them, I think Romania or somewhere, we, we never managed to get any. So I just want to, will they be defected by that or th this needs to be tweaked somehow? And it goes on exactly the same on 4.23. It, again, that it's, concern. It, it's, that, that is in there, it's to safeguard the council for any people who leave the country for a period of time, uh, an extended period of time for three months, then, then we would need to ensure that we've um, got a, a, an accurate record of their criminal history, and they can do that by way of going uh, stiffing of good character from the country that they were in. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think what we've seen so far from the response is OK, and more than acceptable, and more than happy to move the recommendation. Uh, but I've got one very serious question, and it's for a bit of context. I used to, uh, used to help uh, as an assisted player in blind rugby, and I used to have to receive lots of complaints from people coming into Worcester, particularly from Forgot Street, with guide dogs who uh, often refused access to taxis. And obviously not all assistant dogs are guide dogs, there can be other kind of assistant dogs, but I was well aware that this had become a serious issue of concern. And I've realised on page 45 we have the responses which include those from guide dogs for the blind, which make it quite clear uh, what the situation should be and they support our policy. But one of the issues which regularly is, is raised with me is the enforcement of such a policy and our ability to enforce it, especially as some of the people who are prejudiced against it and are being penalised are unable to actually see a badge or a number plate to make a, a complaint. Uh, so it does appear to me that an opportunity here exists for us to actually do some test purchases to actually try and catch any offenders to make sure that they fully understand that assistant dogs will be actually allowed in our vehicles unless they are exempt for the reasons, for medical reasons, as illustrated by the, uh, by the, by the, um, by the, well, by the guide. I'm not sure if that can be done sensibly within, within Worcester. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, we take our responsibilities, certainly around the Equalities Act and in relation to assistance guide dogs uh, very seriously. We have had successful prosecutions in the past and we will continue to support any passengers uh, that are receiving a poor service from our licensed drivers uh, in the area. Um, certainly, we are exploring the option of test purchasing or the mystery shopper exercise, uh, and it's something that we are looking at, especially to support those people that can't possibly report through details for us to take further action. So yes, it, it, it is very much on our radar. We are aware of it, and it's something that we are looking at, and hopefully we'll be able to support those people in due course. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Two things. Well, well, I was going to speak about the reduced uh, CC for engine size and what a good move that is and what a sensible um, change that, that in our policies that that looks to be. I, even not being a member of this committee, I've heard on occasion what seems to be, I mean, we, we've got past it and managed the situation, but it's, it's taken members' time. It's ta you know, it should have, you know, should be something that we, we have amended, and, and I'm glad to see that we are doing that tonight, and that's to be congratulated. Um, I wanted you to raise, though, Chairman, this issue about those who've lived outside the UK for a period of three months or more. I'm I wanted to ask Niall and the officers. I mean, the, there are places where um, people who are refugees or in war zones, who they will not be able to provide this. And the government in power at the time will not want to provide them with certificates of good character or anything else. So how do we get round this, where people are um, coming to this country and unable to, they declare that they've had periods out of 
you know, out of the UK in a way, but they aren't able to, to provide that because it shouldn't be a bar. I mean, you know, just theoretically, should we get a Ukrainian taxi driver who wants to come here and, and you know, you, you know they, they would not at this point be able to satisfy that condition or, or anything like it. And there are lots of war zones and lots of people coming to the UK. How do we manage that? And can you give me some assurance that we, we manage that in, in some different way? Because the policy feels, feels a bit black and white and I'm hoping there's a bit of grey area there. Yeah, what we need to bear in mind is that this is policy. So, so it doesn't take away officers or certainly members uh, opportunity to assess individual applicants. Uh, whilst, yes, some of it is very black and white, and it appears that it's a yes or a no, um, all applicants will have that right of appeal or right to present their case to the council by way of the licensing subcommittee. So, so should those sort of situations arrive, hopefully they'll be able to present their case to the members for members to make a determination. Hopefully that answers your question. If I, if I may, Chairman, I just wonder whether there's something a bit, a bit more um, sophisticated that, I mean, that can be, could be applied here. I mean, I, you know, where there is a clear evidence of why somebody can't provide that, I think to, to insist that they go before a, member, a subcommittee. I mean, the other thing is, it, you, know, you have to know the system to know that if you can't meet this, you can still apply through the, through the back door, as it were, through a subcommittee. I, I, think, we, I think a caveat or something, or, or clarity of some delegation maybe to officers to actually deal with this i think it would be more appropriate in this scenario do you want to come in there? i was just going to say i absolutely get the the, the point um councillor bayliss uh, makes and i won't put vanessa on the spot for, for constitutional <laughs> advice um but i think niall has uh, set out that, that there is a sort of a, a route through um to a subcommittee um to listen to a certain set of circumstances but, but we can absolutely take that away councillor bayliss to look if there's a more pragmatic way of of trying to deal with those with those situations with, with, without um, without upsetting the the actual um, the constitution of the council, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Best, do you want to, want to come? Sorry, just um, just really for clarification, if there is a policy um, that those of you who sit on subcommittees are very familiar with, if someone doesn't meet that policy, they do come before the subcommittee and they have an opportunity to be represented, to bring somebody with them, um, and they will be very much assisted by the licensing officers, and I know this firsthand from, the, uh, from working with Niall and his team, that they will be pointing people in the right direction for the sort of thing that they can bring. But ultimately, the decision that is made to, license, to, to give a license to a taxi driver is the fit and proper test, and it's ensuring that only those that are fit and proper and meet a criteria or satisfy the committee that they're fit and proper can be given a license. So although you have a policy, it's guidelines, it's not tram lines. So if somebody doesn't meet the policy, whether it be on that or whether it be on any other aspect of it, they can come before the committee and they can explain themselves. Um, and they, the officers are very good at sort of giving indications as to what information could be provided. Sometimes people come before committee with character references or information that helps those that are sitting on the subcommittee to reach a decision. Um, but I would say to members that the policy is there for a reason and it should be in the discretion of the subcommittee to be able to exercise that discretion and to license somebody outside it. Um, but the bar is set very high. Um, it is set down in legislation, only those who are fit and proper should be licensed. And I think that bar is set very high and that decision ought to sit, um, sit with members. But there is discretion and those who sit on the subcommittees know how to use that discretion and they're trained on how to deal with that. Uh, hello. Uh, it's, it's going back to the uh, the. Oh. Uh, go, going yeah, going back to the the business of the uh, partially sighted or people with guide dogs, and also that you might not necessarily have a guide dog, but also I do I don't find it acceptable that a person could get in a vehicle and not know what vehicle it is because they're partially sighted. They should actually have some form of information in the rear of that vehicle for them to be able to get it from a smartphone or read it themselves. They, they, surely it is imperative that these people more than anyone else knows what vehicle they're in if they've got to communicate that to a friend or a relative that they're, that they're frightened or, or, or disturbed. They should know what vehicle they're in. They won't know where they're going or where they're being taken. They really ought to know. There should be some form of plate that tell, identifies the vehicle and that driver in that in that accessible to these people you know really I, I just find that quite worrying that that might not be the case is is that the case 
Chairman, if I may. Uh, no, there is. There is a plate on the rear of the vehicle. And there is also a driver's badge. There is also a driver's badge on the inside of the vehicle. And also the fare table with the uh, number of the vehicle inside. I think the issue we have here are severely sighted people with a guide dog, which is why we come back to uh, the legal officers, where we have to have the highest calibre of person so that they won't take advantage of those people and we can be confident. And this, this, these standards are all about ensuring that we have the right people driving hat carriages and private hire vehicles in Worcester City. So we set our standards very high so that those people are, that they can almost be guaranteed uh, a good service from the driver and that they won't be taken advantage of. Is it possible then perhaps some sort of, um, within the trade, identified drivers that could be uh, have this enhanced um, standard? It, it's all of them. Uh, that's where we're getting to, not just individuals. Mm. Uh, the idea is that all of our drivers will be at that standard. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I, I'm concerned about that issue as well. Um, obviously, um, somebody who can't see, can't see the plate number on the vehicle. Uh, they can't read the driver's badge inside the vehicle. Um, it, 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 you know, perhaps we could go to the extent of, of having the, um, the driver's name in Braille. Uh, the, the solution which is ringing around my head, you won't be surprised to hear, is what a good idea it would be to have CCTV in all the vehicles. <laughs> Do you not think that might solve the problem? We have been there, so if I may. Oh, okay. At, at this stage, yes, it's there. We, we haven't closed the door on CCTV. Uh, we felt that CCTV, whilst uh, it's part of this policy, may be better suited when we start looking at the vehicle policies. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at driver policies. We've touched on vehicles, but, but the Department for Transport are going to look at a standard set of conditions for vehicles. Now, you'll remember that I've been talking about these set of standards for, for years in this committee and sort of waiting and, and putting you on notice that it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. Well, we're in a similar sort of position, but, but we probably won't wait as long, hopefully now that we've got the driver standards and the safeguarding standards, that they will look at vehicles. So, so I think that would, might be an appropriate time to look at CCTV. Plus, there is, as we say, that there is a, a cost element uh, to the trade, which at the moment probably isn't appropriate to start bringing in additional burdens uh, to vehicle owners. But, but it's, it's not off the table. Thank you, Niall, for that. I think some of us got a few grey hairs even, even thinking about it. But anyway, we won't go there. <laughs> we won't go there. I think everybody's explored. Can we, can we, can we bring it back into the recommendation? 1.1 um, noted the appendix one, and I think to approve. Can we have a show of hands? Yeah. Thank you, Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, that's done. My turn. Where have we got? Oh. Um, oh, and it's, mm, there's been none. And um, the notice of some other business. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I've given you the answer, Richard. No, I know you don't like no, the answer. No, I think the, I think the committee should hear the, the request. No, I, I, it is a, oh, for, good, for goodness sake, what, <laughs> for goodness sake, I have some openness at committee, otherwise how can members actually request something to be discussed? Two issues were raised in council last time, Mr, Mr. Chairman, uh, re regarding um, budget issues, yeah. pest control yeah, and air I quality think, monitoring. Chair, I think, chair, I think, can we request that a report to come back to a future committee on both issues so we can discuss them? I think um, you wanted to put that on, on, on the loudspeaker, you have done so, but the answer still is no. So, I'm. Um, um, so the request is no, that you will not bring those items to the committee. Uh, I think you've had the answer, Richard. No, I haven't. No, I haven't the answer. no is, is the answer to my question that you will not bring reports to the committee? Uh, I chair, think we... chair, chair, I think, I think Councillor Udall has asked for, for, for an item of, of any other business to be raised. We've heard from Councillor Bayliss uh, with some advice no. as, to, as to what is, what isn't. It's your call, Chair, and as I to whether or not it is an urgent enough. business or not. You're fairly familiar with this territory. Um, yeah, 
if it's a serious business, the, the chair will consider it and give the answer. And you had that. that. Pest control and air quality monitoring is not a serious issue. Yes. No, I haven't had the answer. Can we have this as a committee item at a future meeting? Thank you. We have this every week.